So once again, uh, welcome to this webinar. My name is Isabel Lissner. I'm the International Green Key Coordinator, and I'm very pleased to present today's webinar on behalf of Green Key International to you. This webinar is part of Green Key's biodiversity campaign, which runs from January to August 2022 and encompasses actually not only this webinar series, but also a biodiversity quiz that you can find on our website, a biodiversity online course, and a giveaway campaign that we will start in summer. You can find all details, of course, on our website. But in today's webinar, we want to talk about how we can invite the outside in, uh, better known as biophilic design, and how integrating nature into the built environment can benefit our well-being and our planet. And with this, I would like to welcome our speakers of today, Professor Dr. Willy Lecron, Professor at University of Applied Sciences, who will give us an introduction to the topic, and Miriam Francisco Santana, um, who is the Green Key Project Manager at B Mexico. She will give us some concrete examples from the Green Key Network. Welcome to both of you. But before we start, I would like to present some housekeeping rules to you. So first of all, as you've already seen, this webinar is being recorded. And if you would like to stay uh, anonymous, please close your camera and change your display name. This webinar will be available on Winky's YouTube channel afterwards. So if you think it was interesting and informative, you can forward it to your colleagues or your network afterwards. Please write your questions in the Zoom chat if you have any, and we will answer them after the presentations of um, the presenters. And if you have any questions afterwards, please direct them to finn at greenkey international at finn at v.global. And without further ado, I will leave the floor to Willy Lecon. Thank you so much. I will exactly, I need to share. Oh, there we go. I'm going to share my screen and you should be able to see it as of now. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much. A good afternoon and good morning. I know I have to say good morning for some of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to take part in this Green Key Biodiversity uh, webinar series, in fact. Uh, thank you so much for the organizers. Uh, thank you, Isabel, in particular, for your continuous support. As mentioned, my name is Willy Legrand. I'm a professor at the IU International University of Applied Sciences. And I do research in the field of sustainability in the hospitality sector for the past 20 years. I have a textbook that's coming out in the fourth edition of a textbook that's coming out in July with 700 pages. So there's a lot to say about sustainability these days, but today it's about the value of biophilic design in the hotel sector from back of the house to front of the house. The photo you see on your right hand side right here is a small biodiversity oasis in the urban jungle. That's my garden. It's really micro scale urban agriculture, but enough for a decent supply of potatoes. Uh, and other seasonal fruits and veggies. And now, of course, urban jungle can also look like this, right? A jungle of concrete, asphalts, cars, and yes, you're seeing it, also cooling towers. And we need those badly because we have such increased summer heat waves, so much trapped heat and high density, high thermal mass material, such as concrete. And let's bear in mind that the warmer it gets, the more we use air conditioning, the more we use air conditioning, the warmer it gets. Um, this is a, a picture, as you can see, of New York City. It demands about 10,000 megawatt of energy per second. And during heat waves, that goes, down, goes up to about 13,000 megawatts. So whatever that gap, that's air conditioning, really. Um, I, I was looking at some data on, on, on um, cooling and the heat wave in Beijing in 2018, according to the International Energy um, uh, agency, 50% of the power capacity was actually going to air conditioning. And so, you know, the US alone uses much electricity for air conditioning as much as each year as the UK use in total just for air conditioning. Um, so is there a way out of this trap? So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to keep this picture in mind for later in this presentation. But for now, let's move on. That's my plan of action. Three parts today, setting the stage, discussing risks, looking at biophilia, biophilic design, and the potential for nature-based solutions in urban settings, zooming in into hospitality buildings, 
in particular. And finally, perhaps reopening, if I have time, I'm timing this uh, by presenting what I call deep ecological zone in urban settings. Questions are welcome, of course, in a chat or after. I'll take about 25 minutes to do this. So in the words of Norway's climate and environment minister, it is clear that we cannot solve the global biodiversity and climate crisis in isolation. We either solve both or we solve neither. All right, well, let's take a look at those risks that are associated with conducting business moving forward. And what I decided to take is simply take the report that's the mostly available, and that's a global risk report 2022 from the World Economic Forum. And once more, without surprise, societal environmental risks are at the top concerning risks looking ahead. Environmental risks particularly are perceived to be the most critical long-term threats. Now, if you zoom into our industry, the tourism industry, there are significant risks as well. And we usually classify them in terms of climate change risk in two different types that could affect the financial stability of our hotels and the value of our assets. And so we first have physical risks, such as you know, having a hotel at sea level or close to rivers that may overflow following torrential rains. And we've had that. Many parts of the world have, have had that recently. There's also so-called transition risk where you, know, you need to adjust. You need to do major retrofittings that would be required in the years to come as we move towards low carbon economy. So these are transition risks as well. But if we go back to the major risks, and that's again from that report, climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss. Now, I'm interested in biodiversity loss particularly, and that's really linked uh, and a cause to aggravation to a series of more specific risks. These are the ones on your left-hand side here, um, which include plenty of social issues such as involuntary migration, geoeconomic confrontation, social cohesion co uh, erosions, livelihood crisis, besides, of course, all the environmental specific issues. So climate action failure, biodiversity loss pose really a severe threats to the fabric of society and our activities. But also, we have to remember that half of the world GDP is dependent on nature. That includes us, of course far beyond just nature providing crops for food and beverages that we offer in hotels or access to construction material, hospitality operations, we monetize the beauty of that pristine natural setting at destinations, right? And they often, we often market those to restore the body and minds of guests. And it's really central to the well-being of the guest experience. Now, while nations are struggling, right, with the Paris Agreement to a well below two degrees Celsius, we're actually on the track of 2.4 degrees Celsius, the world of tourism and hospitality seems to be quite serious about decarbonization challenges. We have declarations and pledges and, and methodologies, and I've just listed a few of them, and all of those are open source resources free of charge, right? The Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action and Tourism we had earlier, later last year, all the way down to the second to the last on your list here, the net zero methodology for hotels released this past December, providing really that, what it says, a methodology moving towards a net zero. And so really we're asking a lot of questions. You know, how do we best reconcile international travel with the obligation to go beyond our impacts, beyond climate change, but also foster regeneration. And that regeneration, that's going to link quite well with biophilia in a minute. But if you look at this third one from the list, the pathway to net positive hospitality by the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance, that's really trying to be that. It's trying to, it's the first steps towards what could be a regenerative hospitality, a nature positive hospitality. And that to me fits quite well within the UN Declaration uh, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restorations, which is a, you know, a time frame, 2021, 2030, a, and a response really to unabated degradation of biodiversity. Stated goals are preventing, halting, and reversing the degradation of ecosystem worldwide. Uh, and biodiversity, it's, it's so important to our ecosystem services, as we said earlier, I mean, it's not only that nature delivers to humans, such as the soil and the pollination of our crops and the filtering of air and water, but we still have such a hard time with quantifying that value, actually, the value of ecosystem, especially for the hotel sector, that remains really difficult, but it's clear that many of our processes rely on this. 
one of the things that we are is we are active on every single one of those ecosystems listed by the UN here. And what more, the state of destinations, whether it's a natural or urban destination, doesn't really matter. It's key to the success of our businesses. But here, our industry is really at a crossroad, I think, on how to move forward, simply because finding ecologically intact destinations is like looking at a needle in a haystack. And perhaps we should simply forget it and protect the whole haystack. Why do I say that? We've had scientists that aim to find out how much of the planet is ecologically intact and came to the conclusion that it's less than 3% of the world that remains undisturbed, unspoiled. Many would see this as sort of the last frontier in tourism, right? Um, but arguably, no development of any sort should actually take place in those areas. Those ecosystems are prime target for preservation work. Another 20 to 50% of the planet's surface is under minimal influence of humans' footprint, and the bulk of those locations would be very dry or very cold. And of course, those would be spaces where we should be proactive in our conservation effort. And so this is where we're looking at, there, there's really too many stories in our sector where, you know, we've commodified nature and we've privatized the commons, such as water, we, we've made enclosures, closing off beachfront, closing off forest parts, um, with all the consequences of this. So the way forward really is restorations, and this is where biophilia kicks in. Um, and if we look at biophilia, I think this is perhaps the best quote out there. I go to nature every day for inspiration in the day's work I follow in building the principles which nature has used in its domain, Frank Lloyd Wright. The term, the term, the word biophilia was coined by a social psychologist from 1964 as the love of life. And it suggests that we as species have a set of rule that we learn with evolution and we inherit from an ancestor. And our basic reliance on na nature for survivals over those millennia is the source of the inheritance search for that connection to nature in the modern artificial environment we're all in. I think the American biologist Edward Os uh, Osborne Wilson um, defines biophilia the best. It's this innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes. Uh, Kellert explained that biophilia powerfully asserts that much of human search for a coherent and fulfilling experience is intimately dependent upon a relationship to nature. So in other words, after human migrated to the built environment, we inherited a need for nature, which evolved into thinking about nature. And that's really the main idea behind that idea of biophilia hypothesis. Uh, and that professor, uh, professor in, uh, in social ecology, Stephen Kellert here from Yale University, um, um, explained that better in, in creating a series of nine biophilia values that have great application in the architectural design and physical environment context. And this is where biophilic, biophilic design kicks in, in fact. It's often associated to natural environment in the hospitality sector, but it's not only that. I mean, the value and the benefits associated with contact to and interaction with the nature is transposed into the field of architecture. And that's represented by properties such as this one here from Bill Binsley, Shintamani, Wild Cambodia. Um, and the term biophilic design would thus coin, but there are many interpretation out there of biophilic design. It can be best summarized, however, as a set of strategy where natural elements are incorporated in the built environment. I, I'm not going to make this too long, but there is a great set of, I, you know, um, theoretical basis for this. Uh, the, one of the main component being habitat and dwelling. So we find a, a, a theory called the prospect and refuge theory, the ability to see without being seen, the access to shelter, to hide. There's also the savanna hypo uh, hypothesis where the fact that people still have aesthetic preference to savanna-like environment of mixed woodland and grassland ex escape. There's also the concept of restoration within biophilic design. There is two theories that are linked to this is stress recovery theory refers to the exposure to nature that produce positive emotions contributes to health and well-being. And that's, you know, often we see this in design, right? We have preferred natural features, vegetation, water, natural structures, textures, images. Uh, there's another one, which is the attention restorations, where the interactions with the natural environment helps 
to relieve that mental stress and that fatigue that we often have. And the last part of this setup is place and place attachment theory, which explores the emotional connections we have with places. So when we hear this idea of, oh, we want to design something with a sense of place or a sense of community, well, this is a theory that's particularly relevant to today's hotel operators or travelers alike, because this is discussed so much. So basically what we can do is we can take those three main components and that serves a little bit as a basic understanding of biophilic design in practice. So that same researcher Kellert, Stephen Kellert states that the purpose of biophilic design is about creating good habitat for people as biological organism in a modern built environment that enhances people's physical and mental health, fitness and well-being. Now, in terms of interior design, there are really a lot of attributes. There are six major biophilic interior design elements that were identified. Those six elements are natural features, as we know, plants, uh, you know, and natural features in design, natural shapes and forms such as curves, spirals, arches, natural patterns and processes such as uh, sensory richness in design, ratios, scales, colors and light, natural light, for example, the composition of color plays a role. This idea of place-based relationships, such as what is the meaning of hystero, historical or cultural relationship to a place, as well, of course, as human nature relationships, such as what is your place doing? What is your hotel doing? Is it creating a refuge-like environment that people would like to go to? Or are you designing more for an exploration, for a discovery of nature, for example? So let's merge those two things. Let's merge biophilia and biophilic design along with nature-based solutions. I'm making a big package here with a few examples, looking at the benefits. Here, by the way, what you're seeing is the view from a room in an urban center. So I'd like to move things to an urban center a little bit. Uh, this is a boutique hotel, Stadthalle in Vienna, and guests are immersed right in a natural oasis right in the middle of the city. And biophilic design has a particular relevance to urban areas. You know, urban areas, extremely important to all of us, less than 1% of the Earth's surface, but houses more than half of the people. And it's set to grow, of course, if we look at the amount of building stock, the global building stock, which will double in square meters by 2060. So despite, you know, steel, what I've said the first picture, but I'll come back to that, despite their steel, the concrete, the crowds, the traffic, cities and towns are still ecosystem and the condition of the ecosystem really mark the quality of our lives. If you have a fun functioning urban ecosystem, it cleans your, cleans your air, it cleans your water, it, it cools our neighborhood, which is so important in the summer, and it supports that well-being because it offers us places to play, places to rest. And so urban ecosystems are very important. And let's face it, there are a host of a surprising amount of biodiversity as research shows. So what are our buildings and urban infrastructure made of? Well, of course, we have building materials, the raw process material that are used to build that. And here we would be looking at material and construction technique that include renewable resources and ideally closing the loop in sort of the end of use cycle. So materials such as wood structure, cork, hemp for insulation, etc. Building systems provides people with shelter, right? It's the, 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 the envelope, it, it protects it from cold, from heat, from wind, for precipitation. Uh, but of course, there is the result of that is of course loss of vegetation, loss of habitat, because buildings, of course, seal the soil and it disrupt those cycle. It disrupt, it disrupt the water cycle and the energy cycle. So here we'll be looking at closing some of those loops through green roofing, uh, facade greening, living walls building integrated natural spaces, such as wetland, for example. And finally, the last part is our um, building sites that are the urban space surrounding our built environment. Often we find those to be um, covered in concrete and asphalt, no shades from the trees. Uh, and of course, those space often exacerbate that urban heat island that we the effect that we see in cities. And the consequence of this is that people go back into inside the living spaces and you turn the air con back on. So we're looking at bringing natures into city, enhancing biodiversity. And often you'll see that very neat development is the blue green infrastructure. That is water and vegetation back into the urban uh, centers and back into building, trying to close that loop right, restoring that ecosystem services, providing space for fauna, providing space for flora, but also for humans really to flourish. 
And so let's start with nature. One very important aspect to consider is that nature is not only a capital, as we said before, available to business, but a source of solution to mitigate, you know, want to adapt to climate change, protect biodiversity, but also, you know, enhance human well-being. We often tend to revert always back to man-made technology to fix the problems, but nature is actually a very great ally here. And so that's basically nature-based solution in a nutshell. Right? It's activities, actions that are specifically designed to protect, restore that natural and modified habitat. And for example, cities around the globe, we've tackled urban heat island effect, supporting that so-called green cover replacement or green plot ratio in urban construction. And Singapore is probably leading the way. The basic idea is for the land to be taken away through construction of building to be replaced with greenery within the construction whether via green rooftop, um, green intermediary spaces, green walls, hotel buildings like the Park Royal uh, collection Pickering here in Singapore is on your right hand side is a good example of that. And so that's great example of green cover replacement in urban setting in many cities are fostering this, including the city I am living here right now. And so, of course, I had the uh, boutique hotel Stadthalle as another example. Um, this hotel is, is, has got also passive housing construction, but the point is it offers that green paradise right in front of their room in the middle of the city. And so what do we find? What does the research show here? Well, building with green spaces such as living wall, rooftop gardens, etc., are able to reduce the summer heat gains, cooling demands by reducing that urban heat island effect. They improve air quality, absorb pollutants. So many researchers show this. They improve the water management. They reduce the noise pollution. They increase the thermal comfort of the inhabitants. Green walls, green roofing, uh, that conserves energy because they insulate the building envelope with data showing that a green wall can reduce the temperature of a wall up to 20 degrees Celsius in the summer. And finally, research show, and this is an interesting one, that urban areas, this is a UK-based research, are a significant source of floral uh, resource diversity for insects with 85% of the nectar source attributed to gardens in residential and commercial buildings further supporting the importance of greening urban spaces in and outside buildings. There's also a growing evidence of the benefits of nature-based solutions outweighing the cost of implementation. Now, let's take a look at the green roof case just for fun. So conventional roof, right? Uh, a rooftop is often lifeless. It's lifeless terrain. It serves the sole purpose really is protect the building and inhabitants from the elements. Right. Uh, this is an environment often that's it's it's the sun, it's rain, it's the wind, it's the temperature changes and it captures much of the heat during the hot days, really. And it's making it very difficult to cool down the building floors right below this. And it's aggravating that urban heat island. So green roof, on the other hand, are ecosystem in the sky that designed to really harness that natural ecosystem. So I've taken the example here. This is the rooftop of Trivago um, headquarter in Dusseldorf. It's a, a lead interior design and construction gold certified property. And it's got multiple layers to ensure that the roof is protected, the rainwater is filtered, um, that and drain and that you know you have plants and insects can both thrive and so the living insulation are moderating that temperature fluctuation between winter and summer and the floor below is of course research has shown that floors below a living roof energy used for cooling can drop by 50 percent and so uh, the project drawdown calculated that if if 30% of the roof um, space would be green, added to another 60% of cool roofs, and cool roofs are roofs that reflect the sunlight, by 2050, you would reach 37 billion meters square of efficient roofing globally. And they've calculated that the carbon emissions would be reduced by 0 0.8 gigatons at a cost of 1.4 trillion. And they've calculated that the 30 year saving will be massive, right? Almost a trillion. And the lifetime saving saving over $3 trillion. And let's remember, people who live, work, play near green roofs, enjoy more natural beauty and greater well-being. Now, remember that picture I showed at the beginning, New York City? What if we were able to green those streets? Now, a study was conducted uh, and released not too long ago by the Institute of Atmospheric and Climate Science at the ETH Zurich. And they've used high resolution satellites, land surface, temperature and land cover data. They looked at 293 European cities, looked at the influence of urban trees on the temperatures in cities. On average, street 
where tree cover is found in Northern Europe show eight to 12 degree cooler than similar street with no trees. So it's a matter of shading, of course, but it's also a matter of transpiration. Now, even if you have a city that's got parks or small green spaces, benefit from trees because treeless urban green spaces are overall less effective in reducing that surface temperature and their cooling effect it's it's been found that it's approximately two to four times lower than the cooling induced by the same space when you have urban trees so here's another help to uh, our air con problem while also tackling that urban heat island effect so let's move on how about research and community and you know, community and individual benefits. We know that people suffering from mental fatigue are soothed by natural elements, trees, plants, flowers, animals, and birds. That was also showed through the uh, COVID crisis when people actually tended to plants on their balconies. Even that, even that five, 10 minutes tending to plants was already a, had a regenerating factor. And for travelers, well, Researchers show that mental energy restoration time is accelerated by having access to green spaces compared to when you do a vacation, when you only see built in element that are visible. And so there are clear environmental financial benefits, but here we say the impact guests and employees alike, as well as communities. We found research has shown that integrating green spaces in urban areas result in healthier communities inside and outside the buildings. Green facade are found to positively affect physiological, but also psychological well-being, provide more comfort, relaxation, more cheerfulness, more vigor feelings compared to just plain building walls. Research has shown that the use of nature elements in a hotel minimizes burnout, employee burnout, and increases work engagement satisfaction. And finally, an increase in employee productivity and employee retention also resulted from having more nature inside building. So what does this all mean? Well, the argument would be it's no longer enough to craft a build, beautiful building or space that people will enjoy. Today's hospitality concept should really focus on that people's reaction to the natural surrounding because it's about merging biophilia and the hospitality experience, putting more nature in the hotels and along the same line, fostering that regenerative connection to the outside world or surrounding both in social and environmental term. I'd like to also show, because I have still a few minutes, um, a hotel case, but this time, this is a study. I haven't published it, but this is going to come out later in 2022, I think. We've done a research looking at the back of the house environment in hotels. Um, and what we look is we look at trying to identify sort of employees, back of the house workspaces experience, because a lot of attention has been given to the guests, of course, to the front money-making environments in the hotels and not so much the back of the house spaces, but considering the amount of employee shortage, employee issues, we actually looked at this and we uh, have got some conclusion. We conducted some interviews, so it's very much exploratory in many ways, expert interviews. We looked at managers that had extensive hotel experience, but also specific back of the house experience in their current or previous professional position. So all interviewees had anywhere between four and 16 years of work experience, many of them in back of the house. And so when we asked them to describe back of the house, they say usually, oh, it's rather simple office space, only the necessities, chair, desk, computers. They said, you know, it's rather conservative, rather cool, dusty, cluttered. Light was often mentioned as an issue, clearly linked to the lack of windows in hotel back of the house spaces. There are plenty of research that shows the effect of light on our performance in any case. And, you know, stated by a manager here who said, well, you know, uh, interview number two said, wherever I work in whatever office and whatever department, employees always face with the problem of insufficient light. They're often cluttered and you do not have the opportunity to breathe deeply. And when you're analyzing why the back of the house workspace tend to not be the focus of hotel design, interviewees discuss both the value giving to the workspace, but also the primary focus being the hotel guests, of course, rather than the, the employee. Interview five said most of the hotel management does not really care about the back of the house. For them, it's more important thing is how front of the house looks like, the hotel itself, and they're not interested in the comfort of employees working in the office. The maximum of space is given to the needs of the guests. This means that those square meters should be profitable. Now, that, you know, what's the ideal working environment? Interviewees partially focus on factors such as greenery, natural light, natural colors, 
calm undertones. Every component actually fits back to biophilic design. These are core to be desired work environment. Interviewee for natural elements would be amazing to have like plants, maybe even a living wall. Although none of the interviewees were aware of the term biophilia nor biophilic design, they were aware of the positive impact of those elements in their in their day to day work. And when asked, you know, whether they would implement biophilic design in back of the house spaces, they all concur, of course, interview for lighter tones of color in the walls, no loud noises, a room full of natural light. Also having live plants is really soothing in a room. You feel life. And uh, so they all agreed they had little knowledge on biophilic design, but they understood the importance of it. And also understood that investing in the comfort and well-being of employees should be the paramount of an industry that's really uh, struggling with shortage of employee. And so that employee-employer relationship and the value of design was often emphasized. This is a long quote, but worth it. In interview two, again, it seems to me that they are still not quite ready to understand that a working design such as biophilic design contributes to the development and business itself. Sooner or later, we will come to this because now people have slightly different values. So I want to believe that the employer will move in this direction. What I see now, every new hotel being built, nothing new has been implanted, implemented there. They make it old school. So there's room above, I think, to keep on going for that. I'm just slowly running out of time, perhaps just one last slide and then I'll be done. Um, with colleagues of mine, we've actually developed a model to try to bring all of this together, biophilia, community feeling. Uh, it's colleagues of mine from The Hague and from Copenhagen, uh, Van Rede and Schönrock. We propose a framework where we try to understand the relationship between nature and urban spaces, but also explore and expand on the relationship between ecology, individual, the community and urban society. It gets a little tricky, but I'll do it really quick. We start with this concept of autopoietic system. Um, the basic of autopoiesis system is describe nervous and living things in biology. And so it's systems that are capable of reproducing themselves, hence the link to biology. An organism is that it's got the power to redevelop, to regenerate certain parts. An ecosystem does that as well. It provides, it regenerates new habitat. And so society at large does that as well. And so we argue that all of this is part of communities. We have social systems, we have living systems in community, we have ecosystems. Now, what's important in this, and I'm making a shortcut here, is that we need to have those what we call deep ecological zone where nature is the center of experiences and that is the center of businesses, a sort of form of urban ecotourism. And the thing is hotels can be at the center of this transformation. Why? Because hotel buildings are really predestined to provide safe space for communities of locals and visitors to meet, to develop meaningful connections, to recharge batteries. And that can be done also much better with biophilic design in mind. I'd like to thank you very much. I'm going to skip the donut economics. That was my last slide and it's 30 minutes. And I said I was going to do 30 minutes and therefore, thank you so much for your attention. I'd like to pass on to my next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Willy. That was a very interesting and a perfect introduction to biophilic design. Um, I will hand over to Miriam now, who will give us some examples from the Green Key Network. Um, that have implemented biophilic design. Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel, for giving me this opportunity to attend this meeting. And I'm not able to share. Can you give me? Yes, one second. I made you co host just now. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Well, good morning or good afternoon. Thank you for having me in this Miriam. And I am a Green Key Project Manager. Receive a greeting from the team of Mexico, And I'm going to talk about biofilling design from um, in the hotels in the last two years. 
year uh, uh, during the pandemic and how to improve guest um, experience through connection nature. Mexico is stepping in, into this field. Biofilms aim to support local and, flor and flora um, and also nature lover in order to promote green areas and incorporate natural elements. The hospital industry plays an important role uh, in this um, in biofilm design reflects direct, direct or indirect nature as well as space condition. Uh, in this case, um, Life Aqua Urban Resort Mexico um, support uh, and generate ecosystem service in the urban environmental such as Mexico. And um, also you can find in this hotel a uh, green wall. It is, um, it offers to the guests three main future. And the first one is contribute the human healthy and productivity, and also um, connect with environments bound to, uh, together as ecosystem and also engage and repeat contact with the nature. Those are benefits from the bio, biofilling design when the hotel decide to offer uh, green areas in the hotel to improve the, the guest experience. Versus what is no biofilling design. design. Um, and the first is, um, It's not by your feeling design when exposure to nature does a little impact, impact on humans, uh, well being are no affective. And also, I so like experience of nature externs and disconnect species such as isolate plant or an out of con context uh, picture. I would like to introduce uh, Fiesta Americana Viaducto Aeropuerto. This hotel joined to Green Key Network in 2020. And this hotel is um, a modern uh, building and it, they incorporate Avon Granary landscape um, and you can find a roof garden and what what is the benefit the this um, garden offer us? The first one is um, reduce um, temperature inside to the bill, and also uh, it um, it avoid to use the air condition, and also um, you can find the rainwater harvesting provide a sustainable in order to reduce um, water consumption. And also um, this terrace contribute to human health and productivity. And the second one is a green roof um, that emphasize the connection and environment and bound together as ecosystem. And also you can find a drip um, irrigation system, system to a offer mine things uh, on this uh, roof garden. And the third one, um, it's again and repeat co contact with nature as a guest uh, experience. Apollo, yes, I don't know what happened with my presentation. Um, Fiesta Americana Viaducto Hotels um, is not just about uh, plants. 
in the bios biofilling design also um, use the of pattern and fractal in design giving a holistic approach to the hotel terrains and also um, these areas offer to uh, produce um, good quality uh, about air and also um, it's um, you can get airflow create healthy environmental especially in a polluted um, city such as Mexico. And also um, this um, roof garden provide multiple scents uh, such as smell flowers and feel airflow are fair richer intervention. Another good example is Life Aqua Urban Resort. Um, these um, hotels offer guests um, taking unique experience. As I say, um, you can find a green wall, gives a natural sport that is made uh, natural lover and health healing world of nature, providing them with a physical and emotional impact. Uh, when you uh, arrive to the hotel or get into in the main lobby, you can find a, um, a fountain. And you know, when the drops are fall, fall, fall down, the sound you can uh, help your, your mind uh, bend will. And using this, designing this hotel look uh, located in a chaotic uh, city such as in Mexico make more sense and that's the reason why it's important um, include in our um, architecture uh, species, um, green species in order to reduce a uh, temperature and avoid to uh, use air condition, air conditioner. And also, Mm, this green wall has um, 60 meters long by three meters high. And as I say, um, there is a fountain in the middle. And this structure try to mimic the cure of the wave and also has sustainable design and operational um, function. Uh, for, uh, for instance, a drip irrigation sy system and uh, especially in the early morning, uh, about around um, uh, 50 to 8 a.m. And also um, there are uh, materials or um, they combine such as wood, rocks and furniture as well. And another good example is Fiesta in Monterrey Fundidora. Uh, I'm really um, proud of this uh, hotel because uh, especially du during the pandem pandemic, um, they uh, provide to the start with a space to reconnect with nature and reduce stress. You know, um, we are uh, worried about what is happening and we are we try to figure it out what uh, is going to happen so that uh, increase the labeled uh, stress so they create an oasis on the rooftop top and um, this is a good example how to uh, incorporate um, natural material materials and in bio biophilic space uh, for instance as you can see in the forum um, the guests can enjoy a beautiful uh, view of the east um, Sierra Madre uh, while the guests uh, can sit in down in the wooden swing and also they want to go further and create the green corner the last year and the this uh, space you can find an aromatic bear herb um, garden such as um, mine, uh, rosemary and another herbs 
and they offer this experience and staff and the guests. And also they um, add these um, herbs in the kitchen and in the play in the first uh, place and also the, um, the beverage. As I say, in 2021, they increased a uh, floor for con conscious travelers and they named it um, green floor. And this is a specific floor for the uh, nature uh, travelers. You can find information about green Green Key program, and also uh, you can find uh, several uh, bin in different area to separate uh, way, uh, ways, and also um, you can find amenity, amenities or local amenities to offer to the guests, and also they use um, kind of, of aromatherapy, use um, some um, naturals all to, you know, uh, offer multiple scents to the to the guests. What is the importance of hospitality industry uh, getting to biofilling design? Um, biofilling design offers multiple benefits such as sense of wellness and you know when you think about um, a peaceful and quiet place, uh, you can think about a starry night or just uh, sit down in, on, in front of the ocean or, you know, uh, think about forest. And those um, landscape uh, calm down our nerves or engage the sense and, trigger an intrusional emotional response. And also uh, it's important offer to the guests um, green areas to, to um, improve um, health or mental health. And also um, it's important, especially because most of the people live in the urban area so that's the, the main reason why the build environmental is, is able to contribute or any generation of ecosystem and biodiversity in urban environmental. And in conclusion, I, I would like to say biofeelings uh, or biofilling design work on the principle that human have involved to work and, and with the natural environmental in order to co connect with uh, mother nature and improve physical and mental uh, well-being of guests and staff and the community. And let me know if you have any questions Perfect. Thank you very much, Miriam. You can stop sharing your screen now. So thank you for your presentation as well. Um, I am opening the floor now for questions and we have received one in the chat from Alessandro and it's directed to you, Willy. Um, you might have already read it, I don't know if you've seen it, but he asked about the, um, the problem, issue or challenge with insect infestation. Um, and also the impact of the plants and the roots themselves on the building facade. Um, yeah. So, is it an issue? What is the issue? And what? Yeah, yeah. I think I think there there might be some uh, there might be some fears about this. I mean, I really it heavily depends. I mean, anything with regarding insects and so it really depends on where you are on this planet, of course. Um, in terms of the in terms of the structure itself, there's a great project actually um, for us here in the north. It's uh, in Manchester actually. It's called the Ignition Project. I don't know if Alessandro had a chance to look at it. Uh, the Ignition Project. Maybe it's worth to check it. Uh, I don't have the website here, but you, if you can just search it, I'll just put it in the uh, chat here. Ignition Project. One second. Uh, in Manchester, because they have they have. Um, 
they have it's basically a nature-based solutions in urban uh, urban areas looking at all of the topic that you've mentioned actually Sandro, but but more than that because they're quantifying uh, the impact that nature-based solution has on the value of the real estate and things like that um so there you know obviously a lot of the projects that we're looking at are uh, new projects but there are also ritual you know if we're looking at some of the some of the green roofing and the green facade and so on that's planned from scratch for the from the architects so there's very little doubts to have i think it's in ritual fittings that maybe there are um additional requirements uh, to be looking at um but i think i think a lot of the i mean the more the more we have data the, the better we can answer this question the thing is in science we have i'm not to say i don't want to say that we're at the beginning of this because there's actually quite a quite a bit of data already available but we don't have all the answers to those questions in fact um and geography in fact plays quite a bit of a role here uh, depending on the climate that you're at and what sort of what sort of needs do you have for your nature-based solutions on your building? I mean, are we just talking about a green roof? Are you talking about uh, green walling? Because you're quite right. I mean, I've seen building that have decapitated frontage from from foliage and so on. So there are there are certainly things. But I th as we move along with better uh, experiences uh, and better data from from those experiences, then we can provide better answers. I, I wish I'd be a bit more precise on this, but I mean, I, I'd like to refer back to uh, the report. They have multiple reports from the Ignition Project, but they do discuss that quite a bit. So maybe it's worth to just take a look at this point. Great, thank you very much for the answer. We have a second question that just came in and the question is directed to both of you. Uh, maybe Willie, you can just continue. Um, are there any any quantifiable financial benefits to hotels that yeah. implement systems or design that's right so there's multiple things to look at so the uh, uh so we we have very little data at least from a science from a research point of view regarding the particular case of hotel what we have is we have data on i have data on um, on real estate, so the gain in terms of real estate appreciation from nature-based solutions that we have data on this, which shows a positive, a positive impact. Um, we have, um, so things such as the willingness to pay for hotels, having biophilic. So we have, we have material that is supporting this, but again, a, a willingness to pay. I'm always very careful with this. A willingness to pay research does not mean that it's an action research. It doesn't mean that people are actually paying more for it. Um, the thing that we're seeing, however, is on the cost front, so on a cost saving front. So their ROI on energy saving, especially for us here with, with super high energy costs. So the added value to the consumers, I think we can we can agree that this is probably there that is probably happening we have reports after reports that people are looking for those features that people want to travel uh, more and in, in natural ways they want to leave the place better than they found it we just had the booking.com report last week again reinforcing this so on that front it seems you know that we have this but i think it's hard to quantify we don't necessarily have it all quantified on the cost front, however, uh, that we have it quite well quantified in terms of the energy. So uh, investment, upfront investment for uh, nature-based solution inside, outside buildings and energy savings and things like that, that we have it. And that is, um, that is definitely positive. There is a couple of reports that, that, would, uh, that would lead this way and also scientific research. I don't have them in my head, but I know we have them. Um, and then, so that, so there's, it's the real estate appreciation that's from the owner's side, I guess. Uh, from the operator's side, you have uh, energy efficiency uh, that you can think of. Um, you could argue if you want to push the bucket a little bit that it also is a manage, man, uh, an aspect of risk management uh, in terms of the risk I was talking about, whether it's regulatory risk as we move along towards more regulations in that field, et cetera, that you actually uh anticipating uh net zero and net positive or nature positive issues coming up um but the thing that's a little bit the 
still a lot of talk is about the consumer front. So there is a research about tenants, though. I have seen, I've read that re uh, recently. The uh, the research about uh, so so commercial buildings, but for rentals, not 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 hotels per se, and the amount you know the additional amount of rental income you make from having a building that has nat nature features such as green roof and access to this, and that has been quantified quite interestingly. But uh, I'm missing that in parts in the hotel sector. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, Miriam, would you like to add anything? Do you have any insights from the establishments you are working with that you've just uh, presented? Have they reported to you anything regarding the financial benefits? Uh, uh, we don't have uh, a specific um, result of the uh, financial benefit, but definitely uh, I, in the last month, I, be, I, I went to San Miguel de Allende and, you know, uh, there are a lot of guests interested to um, uh, book um, at that place because they are... Uh, they are, um, how can I say, um, including uh, nature and um, plant um, trees or something like that to, to be more green. And also they increase the, the book about, from the nature lover. I, I, from my point of view, I think is the, you know, where is located because San Miguel de Allende is like, uh, you know, a lot of people come to San Miguel de Allende because uh, it's a quiet and peaceful uh, place. I think so that's the reason. And of course the hotels uh, earn more money because they are um, invest a lot of money to, to be more uh, green or offers green areas to the guests. And that's interesting question because, uh, you know, um it's uh i think it's when you don't have to to economic benefits but in your mind or uh, it do rather that place than the other so i'm gonna um, get more in, uh, information from there but but uh, in this moment, I don't have a specific time what is um, the economic uh, benefit, but I'm, I'm interested uh, about that. If, if I may just jump in, actually, I thought this was very interesting what you said, and just and go back to the question from uh, Abdul Latif. Um, there is one research that we've done actually quite extensively is this, uh, the concept of willingness to stay and the willingness to pay. So the, the, the thing is, the, one of the reasons why I do not trust always the willingness to pay and the impact is because really what, what happens is at the search stage of a stay, right? the customers is, there is a willingness to stay in those properties for sure. There, it's another challenge to actually find them and to actually be informed about them, right? A lot of the travelers will take shortcuts with OTAs, et cetera. I know there's a lot of work that's being done in incre increasing the transparency on there, at least on certain component, including certification. Um, but here, if you're really pushing the envelope on biophilic design, uh, you'll have to find ways to cut through that huge amount of information to actually bring across what you are and that's where really i think we're seeing that that's why it's problematic in fact because it's at the time of decision that it's very important and to what extent are we present there so that raises another question of course in terms of distribution and communication etc but i think that's the reason why we also have a bit of a problem so there's a high willingness to stay but finding those properties and booking them is a different story simply because you have to cut through the amount of information that's out there. Thank you for that addition. Um, we have one more question and um, this is related to the geography. So the question is, and it's directed to you Willy again. Um, so is it easier to implement biophilic design in one place more than another, maybe because of the climate or the humidity of the place? Um, when we think of specific um, species, for example, that grow outside. So um, could you say a few words about that? Is it something that- Yeah, I, I think, I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's huge difference. I mean, it's the same, it's the same as, 
when I look, I've done a lot of work on passive solar design. And I mean, if I look at the passive solar design that's been done in the Northern countries, whether I compared to humid, hot yeah, countries that actually requires other, other sorts of passive design because it's mostly about trying to cool. Whereas here, it's mostly about trying to keep the heat. Um, so there are differences as well in the way that nature is being used or, or uh, for buildings, whether it's about insulation, uh, well, with, with the main capacity of insulation and providing that, of course, that that regenerative experience to your customers. But from a from a from a real estate point of view, in terms of insulation, either protection from the sun or protection from the other elements in terms of your keeping your heat or whether you're actually using this as a way for you to foster uh, natural air flows and perspiration and humidity around you to refresh the people. So I think, yeah, geography does play a role in the way you do this. I think, I think it's quite fascinating, actually. I'm, I'm not an architect. Uh, I am a geographer from a background, uh, studies environmental uh, and geographer. So I find this very interesting, but I think I think there are differences in the way, at least in the way that we implement this. It might be slightly different inside the buildings and in the way that we uh, we do this with our customers in terms of creating that feeling. Um, but definitely, when we look at the envelopes and the components around the building, yes, geography plays a role. Thank you very much. Um, I have not seen any further questions. Um, but this would be the last chance if there are any last minute questions now. But otherwise, uh, I can already thank both of our speakers. Thank you so much for your time today. It was really interesting. It was a great introduction to uh, biophilic design and hospitality industry. Uh, great examples, uh, great summary. So thank you very much. And yeah, thank, you, thank you very much to all of you and also Miriam to, for your presentation and the amazing questions actually, they're very good and very pertinent. I have to agree. Yes, they were very good. Thank you very much. And to those of you that are um, following this webinar, if you enjoyed this webinar, if this topic is of interest to you, we would like to invite you to our third webinar, actually, that is happening on the 12th of May, same time. And here we will look more into other solutions for the hospitality industry, um, hands-on examples of what you can do in your hotel, in your restaurant, to contribute or support biodiversity. To give some examples, we will talk about sustainable seafood and pollinator-friendly gardens. And um, you will find the webinar link in the follow-up email that we'll receive after this webinar. You find all the resources in another link that will also be in this follow-up um, email that we will send to you. And of course, you will find all the information on our website as well. And with that, I would like to thank everyone again for participating, to our presenters. Have a wonderful day and hopefully see you at our next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Finn. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Isabel. Miriam, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, thank you. Bye.